Welcome to the third webinar in the COVID-19 conversation series, brought to you by the APHJ and the NAM. This is the third of a series whose purpose is to explore the state of science on COVID-19, to inform policymakers, public health and healthcare professionals, scientists, business leaders, and the public. The previous two webinars address the signs of social distancing, the benefit risk analysis of social, physical distancing strategies, and explore what science is available to guide eventual relaxation of measures. Today, we'll discuss emerging evidence on COVID-19 spread and treatment. I'd like to thank my co-sponsor, George Benjamin, the executive director of APHA, for his support of this very important effort. I'm also grateful for the input of our expert advisory group, co-chaired by Carlos De Rio and Nicole Lurie. You can find all the advisors listed at covid19conversations.org. If you have any questions or topics you'd like us to address today or future webinars, please enter them in the Q&A box or email us at apha at apha.org. If you experience technical difficulties during the webinar, your questions in the chat box. Please pay attention to the chat for announcement about how to troubleshoot. So this webinar will be recorded and the recording transcript and slides will be available on covid19conversations.org. Our next webinar will take place on Wednesday, April 15th at 5 p.m. Eastern time. and will focus on crisis standards of care during this particular pandemic. Now I'd like to introduce our moderator for today's webinar, Dr. He Peggy Hamburg. Dr. Hamburg is a foreign secretary of the NAM. She's also former commissioner of the US FDA, having stepped down from her role in April 2015 after almost six years of service. Peggy, welcome and take it away. Thank you very much. Can you hear me? Um, so as we move forward together to combat uh, COVID-19 in our country and around the world, one thing that is absolutely clear is that we must leverage and advance the best possible science to help us address the critical questions before us to lead to meaningful, lasting solutions and to help us really make decisions day to day as we put in place the programs and policies necessary. So I'm very, very pleased to be part of today's uh, webinar. And today we're going to examine some of the newest data available to understand how long COVID-19 remains active on surfaces or in the air. We're also going to hear the latest news about one very promising treatment that's being studied for COVID-19, uh, the use of convalescent plasma, which is now very much in the news. Of course, there are many treatments that are being developed and studied to address COVID-19. Uh, some old drugs being repurposed, some new drugs being developed based on new scientific knowledge about this novel coronavirus. Um, and a future uh, webinar will uh, focus on the broader range of new treatments under discussion. Since we can't do justice to them all today though, we're going to focus on just one of them. And we'll also then have a conversation about ethical considerations for using treatments that haven't gone through the rigorous trials that our system uh, typically requires. So I'd now like to introduce our expert panel. First, John Lowe, the Assistant Vice Chancellor for Interprofessional Health Security Training and education at the University of Nebraska Medical Center. And he'll share his team's latest findings with regard to surface and aerosol stability of the virus. Then Arturo Casadevall, Chair of Molecular Microbiology and Immunology at Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. And he will talk about his work to develop a treatment from convalescent plasma. And then finally, Alta Shero, Warren P. Knowles, Professor of Law and Bioethics at the University of Wisconsin at Madison. And she will be asking some of the tough 
ethical questions that are so important in the current situation. So thank you all for being here. And over to you, Dr. Lowe, to get us started. Excellent. Thank you, Peggy. Um, and I'll just wait while my slides get brought up. And Susan, are my slides live? Yes. All right, thank you so much. Um, I'm having trouble seeing them, so I will just uh, go off of, off of your info. But uh, so I'm gonna talk about uh, the current state of, of knowledge and the results of a study that we conducted at the University of Nebraska Medical Center on the surface and aerosol stability and transmission dynamics related to SARS-CoV-2. Um, this work represents the work of a large team, and I, I just wanted to highlight those members conducting rapid response research in the midst of a pandemic as there's very lim limited information um, is difficult and takes a, a very robust collaborative team. So I wanted to thank all of those members. Uh, next slide. So context matters in terms of uh, understanding the importance and the value and why we conducted this particular study and why we're, inf why we're interested in its transmission dynamics. Um, since the emergence of SARS-CoV-2 and the COVID-19 illness in late 2019, there's been significant debate about transmission routes for the virus. Um, and, and this debate is important because it drives national and international guidelines, which drive resource allocation, which drive how, how we deem best to protect um, healthcare providers, um, and ultimately informs the public health interventions that we implement uh, to, to stem the spread of the disease. Next slide. I think there may be some problem with the viewing of the slides. Just sorry to interrupt, but um, can that be addressed? Yes. Apologies for a momentary pause in the program, but I think that it, ah, success, I believe. Thank you, Susan. Sorry uh, about that. Oh, no worries at all. I appreciate that. So um, again, context matters. And I want to set the timeline in terms of events, because this has been a rapidly um, progressing body of, of information. So uh, important to note that as we've you know, identified that the, the SARS-CoV-2 really emerged, or reports of its emergence really started late 2019. Uh, by February 7th, we really saw a landmark report published in JAMA um, out by our collaborators and partners in China, identifying you know, broad characterization of the infection across 138 hospitalized patients. Uh, what was significant in terms of transmission dynamics reported there is that really documented uh, firm evidence for nosocomial transmission of, related to SARS-CoV-2, uh, but, but still left wide open the role that aerosol transmission or environmental contamination might be playing in the, the transmission of this infection. Next slide. So, um, you know, the world watched with great interest trying to pull whatever information we could out of the outbreaks that, that were occurring in China, um, latching on to any information that, that we could get our hands on and try to use that to inform national and international preparedness efforts in terms of equipping and training healthcare workers across the globe. Um, then in mid-February, early to mid-February, we started hearing these reports uh, off of the Diamond Princess cruise ship and a number of other cruise ships um, reporting significant um, transmission amongst populations in those cruise ships. Next slide. And this really, um, I think, focused our attention and our interest on what might be happening related to this virus, um, at least with the information that was coming off the cruise ships that was fairly well documented. Um, we saw significant numbers of cases and uh, community attack rates. So the, the, the documented um, community attack rate in the, the, princess, the Diamond Princess cruise ship among those that were tested 
was about 20% of the passengers. Um, and then there's also been estimated attack rates uh, if we had been able to test all of the passengers, estimating upwards of a 40% attack rate. There's been a, a significant number of other examples, especially with related to cruise ships, uh, notably the SS Greg Mortimer that, that reported a, a almost 60% attack rate in passengers on that, on that cruise ship. Um, clearly indicating that cruise ships appear to be a unique permissive environment for SARS-CoV-2 spread and, and we're curious as to what the, the different transmission dynamics are that, that make that the case. Um, some considerations being close quarters and high densities of, of individuals that likely have frequent contact, um, key uh, crew members that are doing uh, food prep or delivery of items to rooms after quarantine and, and room isolation has been implemented, uh, and then of course unknowns about air handling systems and uh, wastewater treatment and, and systems on those cruise ships as well. Uh, so with this in mind, next slide, uh, we started to prepare um, and, and try to decipher, are we going to implement airborne isolation precautions, contact droplet precautions, uh, and the like, and really trying to work through that. On March 4th, our colleagues in Singapore, um, led by Khalees Marimuthu, uh, conducted some environmental and air sampling related to the initial patients that presented in uh, Singapore and provided some, some good evidence. So they were able to take um, samples in three rooms, a broad set of environmental samples and air samples, and, and targeted collection of those samples around environmental cleaning, uh, which was important to note. And what they found is that uh, not much SARS-CoV found in the environment after cleaning. In fact, zero of their environmental samples with the exception of one sample off of a boot of a healthcare provider and none of their uh, air samples uh, came back positive. Next slide. Then on March 9th, two days later, uh, we had more evidence emerge uh, indicating, and this was conducted by uh, a group at the National Laboratories um, with a, a series of lab studies really trying to characterize the, the stability of the virus on surfaces and in the air uh, specific to SARS-CoV-2. Um, and this group, in, in conducting this series of lab studies, really identified that the virus can remain infectious uh, in aerosol for up to three hours in an environment and, uh, you know, and remain in, in the environment on solid surfaces for a variety of durations, the longest being 72 hours on, on solid surfaces such as plastic. Uh, but again, starting to add more evidence and understanding for us in terms of the role the environment or the air, aerosol may play in the mission of this particular uh, infection. Next slide. So the group at the University of Nebraska Medical Center um, had the opportunity, again, based on a great deal of advanced preparation um, to uh, ready a team to conduct environmental and air sampling, a fairly robust protocol um, as patients arrived at UNMC. And we can go on, yep, thank you very much. And our, the preliminary um, uh, results of this have been made available publicly on MedRx. Um, we're providing the link here so that uh, it, it can be accessed. I think it's important to note that this work has not been fully peer-reviewed yet. Um, and a lot of the work that I'm going to review, I'll, I'll highlight that uh, when it's not peer-reviewed, because this is an important criteria that we need to take into account and, and provide that caveat that peer review is a really important aspect to making determinations if research has been conducted um, adequately for us to make actionable decisions off of. Um, so this is, this is that manuscript and where it's available. Next slide. So the experience at Nebraska really started on February 17th um, and, and, and went from there when we received a, a cohort, an initial cohort of 13 individuals that were repatriated off of that Diamond Princess cruise ship. Um, additionally, through later days, received two more individuals from that cohort off the cruise ship. And what's important about this, this group and the study that I'm going to talk about is it, it represents environmental and aerosol sampling study that, that crosses a spectrum of illness. So uh, many of these individuals had mild illness that would only typically require home isolation. Others had a more severe illness that would require a hospitalization. And so we conducted sampling in both of those environments. Next slide. 
So the two environments that this is relevant to are two very highly controlled environments. Um, our Nebraska Biocontainment Unit, which is where we cared for initial index patients that were cared for at our facility. Um, uh, it's a, it's a, an advanced um, isolation unit capable of critical care intervention. And then our National Quarantine Unit um, that again represents a, a residential isolation space, which is uh, fairly unique and we'll get into that. But both of these have similar characteristics in terms of engineering controls of negative pressure, staff that are trained and, and robust protocols on how to navigate in this space. Next slide. So our sampling um, encompassed uh, sampling in rooms um, adjacent or rooms that were being used to care for three individuals that, that were hospitalized um, on day 10 of admission. Uh, two of those rooms were sampled on day 10 of admission for those individuals and the third on day four of the admission. Um, and then in the national quarantine unit, uh, we sampled nine residential rooms, all with individuals that were mildly symptomatic, very mildly ill. In some cases were, uh, you know, switching status between asymptomatic and mildly symptomatic on a day-to-day -day basis, but all of those samples were collected between days five and nine of admission. Um, one other thing that is, is really important to note in terms of why we conducted this study, aside from, you know, just needing evidence globally to best protect our healthcare providers and prioritize resources, uh, here at Nebraska, the National Quarantine Unit had always been intended to provide quarantine. That is, um, isolation or, or quarantine of individuals that have been exposed, but are not necessarily ill. And uh, this situation uh, required that we put confirmed cases with mild illness into this space. And so we, for our own interest, were interested in um, doing rapid quality improvement, quality assessment of pro protocols for that type of use, which was a new use case for us. Next slide. So the samples that we collected, again, these are, are, are fairly uniform across the two spaces, the hospitalized rooms and the residential isolation rooms. So we collected a, a broad set of surface, uh, room surface samples, focusing on ventilation grates, tabletops, um, and window ledges. We also sampled personal items, um, looking at cell phones, exercise equipment that were used, TV remotes and the like, um, and also toilets. And then we collected two categories of air samples high volume, uh, high flow air samples that were collected in the rooms and outside in the hallways. And then also low volume air samplers that were affixed to the, the sampling personnel that were in the space moving around. Um, important to note that our, our assessment, our laboratory evaluation of these specimens was done via uh, PCR, similar to uh, the other studies that have already been mentioned. Next slide. So broad set of results, um, moving quickly, so we can stay on time here. Um, uh, broadly speaking, uh, the, we did two rounds of sampling in the quarantine unit, again, with those in more of a residential isolation or home isolation type uh, situation. Uh, we did find broad environmental contamination, uh, which you'll see through the first half and, and kind of the second half of, of this particular chart. Um, we did identify st statistically significant uh, reduction in the level of environmental contamination in terms of sites sampled that were positive between the first sampling and the second sampling, um, which were days apart. Um, the last three uh, bars on this graph all the way to the right hand side represent the environmental sampling sites in the, in the hospital rooms, um, so in the biocontainment unit. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about those um, in a second. So next slide. Um, so broadly speaking, um, these are um, just percent positive across all the rooms by site type. Um, important to note. And, and really, I mean, the main takeaway here is that we had widespread environmental contamination. Um, I think to contrast that with our Singapore colleagues that were really targeting uh, environmental sampling with environmental cleaning, I think there's something that should give every, everyone a lot of confidence and of resolve to implement environmental cleaning, even in the chaos of managing cohort wards or surge wards related to COVID, that it does markedly buy down environmental contamination and risk of, of fomites. Um, notable here, um, we, we did find a significant uh, contamination or positive samples on air handling grates, which again, for our purposes, starts to indicate the potential of aerosol um, 
uh, transmission or transport of virus. Um, window ledges are important finding here as all of these window ledges were greater than six feet away from patients. Um, and then of course, toilets that supports other literature in terms of the, the fecal oral transmission uh, potential as well. Next slide. So here we have results of the uh, hallway air samples and personal air samples. Um, just to note, uh, a significant number of our hallway air samples uh, came back positive, um, roughly 60%. Although these were negative pressure rooms, I think it's important to note, especially when thinking through how to compare this to your operational um, environment or the Singapore studies, is our rooms were not equipped with anti-rooms. Um, and so again, this might just indicate the value of those anti-rooms. And again, uh, airflow is, is different for all of these spaces. I think the important thing that I want to note here on this table is uh, in the lower portion of this table for the, the NBU, which is our hospital isolation, um, the, the air samples that have the highest concentration of virus, and again, this is copies of RNA uh, per liter of air, are really the personal air samples samplers, which uh, kind of indicate that the personnel in the space, moving around the space, are, are being exposed to uh, viral RNA for sure um, at, a, at a higher level than, than some of the surfaces that, that we um, sample. Next slide. Um, so on this next slide, this is a, a big table. I'm just going to highlight a few things and then we'll move on because we've got a, a lot of um, ground to cover with my other presenters. Um, but the in-room air samples, really the bit main takeaway is that 63% of our in-room air samples were positive by PCR. Uh, two, or, two of three of our air samples collected outside of six feet, so again, this was in the hospitalized individuals' rooms, uh, were positive by PCR as well. Again, supporting that notion that at least viral RNA is being carried via the air um, greater than six feet. And then um, the highest concentration um, in, in broad um, air contamination samples was really identified in a room where an individual was on a low flow nasal cannula with one liter of oxygen. Um, so again, this is something that is, is an area of interest for follow-up as well. I'll touch on that in a minute. So next slide. So broad conclusions to move quickly. Um, we, we identified and documented ubiquitous environmental contamination, not necessarily linked to symptoms or severity of illness. Again, I think it's important to couch this in the findings of our Singapore colleagues on the value of environmental routine environmental disinfection. Um, our PCR positive air samples outside of six feet, I think provide additional evidence uh, of the potential of aerosol transmission. But again, uh, we did not evaluate the particle size or distribution potential of those particles in this particular study with our methods. Um, and as already noted, the value of environmental disinfection. So uh, next slide. So areas of interest that we've heard from colleagues around the world and that we're very interested in as well is starting to investigate, does, do all of these environmental and aerosol uh, samples contain uh, infectious virus? I think this is the next domain of investigation that really needs to be sorted out to help inform protocols. Um, to determine the particle size for the carriage of RNA and infectious virus, again, how far are those particles like to, to carry, likely to carry that virus? Um, what is the infectious dose? So how can we translate in the event that we do find this information? What does that mean for an infectivity or infectious risk? Um, looking for longitudinal studies of viral shedding throughout the course of infection. So we have a greater understanding of the transmission potential for asymptomatic, pre-symptomatic, or different stages of severity of illness. And then we've heard a lot of interest and we know a number of groups are looking at the role of, of various oxygen delivery systems and generating aerosols in the clinical space. Next slide. And so one study has come out since uh, ours was reported again by our colleagues in Singapore, uh, led by Khalees Merimuthu, um, where they've actually looked at this fractionation of aerosols and identified positive for, R for viral RNA in aerosol particles greater than four microns and between one and four microns. So again, further evidence that kind of takes the next step from our study in looking at the potential for uh, aerosol carriage of the virus and the RNA. Next slide. And this is my final slide. I think it's important to note as we've uh, been helping folks translate our findings that again, have not been peer reviewed yet is one, the importance of environmental cleaning, um, really uh, looking at ways to protocolize that and do it regularly. 
Um, for us, this has given us resolve to implement negative pressure and barrier precautions wherever we can in the care for suspected or confirmed uh, COVID-19 patients. Um, to really look at staff flow, um, can we minimize the number of, of healthcare providers that need to enter a space? Um, and then again, I, I always want to point out that as we go through those, you know, cleaning, environmental controls, administrative controls, the bottom thing that we go to when we look at hierarchy of controls is PPE. Um, so these other, these other domains are more effective, uh, but we tend as healthcare providers to pivot a, a first and foremost to personal protective equipment, which is important, but some of these other controls um, have higher efficacy. So that concludes my remarks, and I'm, I'm happy to hand it back to you, Peggy. Well, thank you very much. Really interesting, important work that reminds us about the importance of doing real-time research to inform our policies, activities, and programs in an ongoing way. We'll turn now to a rather different but equally important topic having to do with therapy, and, and I'll ask Dr. Casa Duval uh, to tell us about his work on um, uh, convalescent plasma as a treatment for COVID-19. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Hamburg. So the first slide will just be convalescent plasma for prophylaxis and treatment of COVID-19. Next slide. So the first question is, what is convalescent plasma? Plasma is the liquid in the blood that holds the blood cells. It is obtained by separating the cells from the fluid. Now, when you look at the literature, it's sometimes this uh, product is referred to as sera, and sometimes it is referred to as plasma. That just has to do with whether it contains clotting factors. It doesn't affect the antibody content. The antibody content is the same in both. However, today, in 2020, we use plasma. We don't use sera, and this is a, the way that I will refer to it. Even though when you look at the old literature, you will see the word sera and serum therapy used over and over again. It, the plasma can be obtained by donors for plasmapheresis, and it is obtained by standard transfusion practices. And that's important because people need to know that this is a very well-regulated industry that really knows what it's doing and that they have the capacity to take out the, the plasma and to give you a unit just like it's shown in the bottom. On the right part of the slide, you will see a diagram that breaks up the red cells, the buffy coat, those are the white cells, and then the plasma is much of the volume of the blood, uh, which is about 55% of the total volume. Next slide. So the principles are straightforward. When you have an infectious disease, a viral infection, and you get better from it, there are usually antibodies in your blood. These antibodies, in the case of many viral infections, can kill the virus. So when you recover, you have these antibodies and then you have a blood draw. And in the plasma, these antibodies are found that can then be used for two major ways of combating COVID-19. One of them will be for prophylaxis. You give antibodies to people and you give them immediate immunity. After they get the infusion, they have these antibodies on board that will be protected, or they can be used in therapy. And we'll talk about both of them. Next slide. So it's important to know that convalescent serum, notice that here I'm using the old terminology, or plasma has been used in past epidemics. There are hundreds, if not thousands of papers in the literature in which a serum was used. It was used in the 1918 epidemic, if you look at the data from the time, the doctors thought that it worked. It was used to stop outbreaks, such as convalescent measles in schools, and it was used for breaking up epidemics of orchitis. Uh, it was used in polio when it struck in cities. The practice ended pretty much after the 1950s for two reasons. One was the discovery of blood-borne pathogens, which were not known previously and by the way for which we screen today. And the other reason was that many of these diseases, uh, in particular childhood diseases, began to disappear with the advent of vaccines. Next slide. So the important component in plasma is a specific immunoglobulin. 
immunoglobulin is a scientific word for the word antibody. So the, the, the plasma has a lot of antibody, but now when you recover it, it has antibody that can kill the virus. These antibodies include both IgM and IgG. IgG has a half-life of about 20 days. That's important because it would suggest that an infusion of, of plasma could provide antibody for a while, for a few weeks. It is a complex mixture of antibodies, different classes of antibodies, antibodies that bind different parts of the virus. And that's important because uh, often neutralization works best if you can hit the virus at multiple places. The effective immunoglobulins fall into two categories, neutralizing antibody, that's antibody that kills the virus, but there is also a, a set of antibodies known as non-neutralizing antibodies that can mediate protection by other mechanisms including binding to FC receptor and mediating the phenomenon of antibody dependent cellular toxicity, phagocytosis and complement activation. Next slide. So we do have some experience with the use of convalescent plasma for two other coronavirus diseases. SARS coronavirus, which occurred in 2003. There is the best study came out of Hong Kong in which 80 patients with SARS coronavirus were treated with convalescent serum. And they documented a often almost threefold increase, actually a threefold plus increase in discharge among those that were treated with convalescent serum. I stress to you that even though these numbers look good and even though they make statistical significance, this was not a prospective clinical trial. This was a, a series of cases that were analyzed retrospectively to see how well they did. And for MERS coronavirus, there has been anecdotal use. The problem with that has been finding donors. It turns out that MERS coronavirus often doesn't generate very high titers of antibody and survivors. And what's been found to be well tolerated, but the efficacy has been difficult to assess. The next slide. So China very rapidly moved on to use convalescent serum against COVID-19, and there are now as of yesterday, three papers in the literature. You can see they're in very respectable uh, peer-reviewed journals. The one in JAMA described five critically ill patients treated with this who did well. There is um, uh, the paper in PNAS describes another set. I believe it's either 10 or 15 patients. And the, pac and the paper in CHESS describes uh, five patients. So the data is starting to come out of China. The data are encouraging. The data are positive, but again, one needs to look at these publications with care and with rigor because they are not controlled clinical trials in the sense that, that we often do in order to establish efficacy. The next slide. The Italians are using it. And even though it's not in the literature, I can tell you from reading from my Spanish that the one on the left says plasma funciona, which I interpret as plasma works. And the other one uh, says um, that that uh, was also that the first results were positive. So again, when you uh, look at the experience for Northern Italy, which is not in the medical literature yet, is appearing in newspapers. The data are encouraging. The next slide. So uh, we have written uh, two papers on this. These are how to. Uh, the both have been published in the clinical in the journal Clinical Investigation. Uh, the journal worked really hard to get this stuff reviewed and published often within a week. Uh, the, the paper on the left sets out the big picture, sets out the case for doing it. The paper on the right was just published yesterday or the day before, and it reflects everything that we have learned in the past month trying to put together a trial. These papers are free for download. You just have to go to their website and, and download them. The paper on the right includes things like what dose would you use? Uh, what would be the, the flow by which you would identify individuals to donate? Includes a risk benefit analysis uh, of the use of convalescent serum. And I'll say a couple more words about it. Next slide. So here's the workflow, and it is complicated. It is complicated, but I'm just gonna basically uh, work you through it. And on the right, you see a report that was in NBC News 
of a donor uh, donating two units of plasma in New York City. So the what it so to work through all this, if you're more interested, you can download the paper and look at it yourself. But basically, we need people people who recover from COVID-19. That is, they had a documented test and they had the disease. Then we gotta wait at least two weeks. Then these people need to be tested to make sure that they have cleared the virus by PCR. One of the problems that we've seen is that a significant number of people still have a positive PCR at, that, at two weeks. We don't know what that means. We don't know if that virus is infectious. It could just be reflecting RNA in, in secretions that is remaining, but you gotta be cautious with this virus. Therefore, we're not allowing people to come in and donate blood until they have been shown to be negative. So that is putting a, a bit of a logistical hurdle in getting lots of donors, but we think that as time goes on and we have a lot more people who recovered and we have a lot more people that are now three to four weeks out, uh, that there will be um, a lot more, the problems, the logistical problems will become easier. Then this plasma is collected in a facility where they collect plasma. It is tested for all the things that plasma is tested for. It is tested for other infectious diseases, and then it is typed, and then one has a unit of plasma that is convalescent that you can potentially use in an individual. It needs to be ABO compatible with the recipient. And uh, this is uh, the workflow that we have arrived at after several weeks of learning how we're gonna deploy this. The next slide. So the FDA, uh, these are from their website. The FDA has moved very quickly on this. And I uh, compliment my FDA colleagues. Uh, they've been superb. They've been, uh, conversations have gone back and forth. And you can see how rapidly uh, this has moved. In March 24, we, have, we had approval for compassionate use. By April 3rd, Hopkins have been granted permission for clinical trials of convalescent plasma in high-risk individuals. April 3, FDA allowed expanded access. And yesterday, they provided additional recommendations. So uh, this air, the web, FDA website is a rich place to look for details on how to implement this. Next slide. Okay, so it's always important. Every medical procedure has some risks and we have known risks and theoretical risks. So the known risks are transfusion reactions and some rare risk of infectious disease. These are very low, but they are not zero and they would happen with the use of plasma, and they are associated with the use of plasma in the medical uh, arena, where plasma is often used in surgeries and other procedures. And then there is a theoretical risk that hasn't been seen yet, but we need to always keep in mind their possibility, and that is that antibodies can trigger a pro-inflammatory pro reaction that could make things worse. I stress that the data from China and the, and the anecdotal data that we're getting is that uh, this it hasn't been seen, but perhaps we need to be on guard because as more and more people get treated, you may, be, you may see some of these uh, effects. The uh, block it all paper that I was talking about in JCI, you could look at it, has a formal risk benefit analysis and suggests that the benefit is greater than the risk for all age groups. Next slide. So where is the current status? Compassionate use has been done in the United States. Places like Hopkins are gearing up to do formal trials. Many countries are deploying convalescent sera, and here this is just taken from the news. It includes the United Kingdom, France, Italy, Spain, Argentina, Panama, et cetera. Uh, and by et cetera, I mean the many places that have contacted us and we have shared protocols with. This appears to be a worldwide effort currently, and one of our hopes is that all these countries as they get any experience, share it with others because we need to learn how to, how to do this. Uh, so clinical trials and preparation include at least four prophylactic use, early therapeutic use, that is, can plasma prevent people from getting worse? Can plasma prevent people who are having shortest breath from having to go into the intensive care unit? A late therapeutic use, that's comparable to compassionate use, people that are on the unit 
that are on respirators, will they benefit from this? I will stress that most of the use that is in the literature from China has been late therapeutic use. And even though antibody always works best early, I'm encouraged by the fact that they are reporting some uh, positive results with late therapeutic use, which is a situation in which often antibody doesn't work. And then there are pediatric protocols in the development because it is clear that kids are getting this also and that they may need it. Today, the major problem is logistics, implementing this on a large scale. We don't have mechanisms in place for taking convalescent plasma. We have great uh, facilities in place for blood drives and other blood products. But the problem here arises that we need to get a particular population, which are recovered people, you need to test them for the virus, and then you need to ask them to come back in. And in New York City, you see that uh, picture. Um, this is the Orthodox community has been incredible at organizing itself and, uh, and identifying donors uh, and providing people at, for, um, for blood donation uh, at the various uh, places that are taken. Next slide. So, no, one more back. Donation information. This always comes up. You want to donate. How do you do it? The Red Cross is collecting plasma across the United States. In New York, the, the New York Blood Center is collecting plasma. And then you have the specific institutions that are using their transfusion facilities to collect plasma. For example, Sinai in New York City, Methodist in Houston, and Hopkins. And we have a website that you can go to known as ccpp19.org. And there is a, a mechanism by which if you know that you have had uh, co uh, uh, COVID-19 and you want to donate, the, we are collecting some information to match you and your zip code with facilities uh, for donation. And then my last slide, closing thoughts. So history provides in strong encouragement for its use. It is supported by strong uh, basic science. We have over 100 years of knowledge of antibody action. I should point out that the first Nobel Prize was given to Emil von Behring for serum therapy. This is how old this is. Plasma therapy is relatively safe. It's as safe as transfusion practices. However, I caution that, co that COVID-19 is a new disease. This is a new virus and we won't know how well this works until we carry out formal clinical trials. The anecdotal evidence and the patient case series is encouraging, but we need randomized controlled trials to know if, when, and how to use it. The challenge today is logistical, logistical, and logistical. It will get easier. We are learning how to do this better. We will have a lot more people capable of donating in the next few weeks. And I think that Today, plasma is a, a very scarce commodity, but I think it will become more plentiful as the days go by. That's it, thank you. Thank you very much. And your closing thoughts, I think, are a very nice tr uh, transition to our next uh, speaker, um, Alta Shero, who is our legal and ethical scholar. Before she begins, let me just remind you also, though, that there will be a future webinar on um, some of the research and development that's going, around, going on concerning other potential drug treatments and uh, stay tuned for that. Now let me turn uh, to Alta. Hi, thank you very much uh, and greetings out there. Um, Susan, can you move to the next slide, please? Uh, I want to start very quickly with background that I suspect many of you know, but just to make sure everybody is uh, on track, that um, there is a usual process for developing therapeutics that involves a series of research endeavors, starting with in vitro and animal, often animal preclinical work, uh, and then the development of a protocol for trials that typically involve a control arm. Uh, it could be a standard intervention versus then a standard plus, or it could be placebo if there's really no treatment available. And then a very slow stepping up in terms of the number of people who are going to be uh, recruited, 
and a change from safety primary to safety and efficacy primary along the way in terms of what you're looking for. The trials are usually prospective and randomized in order to make sure that you are actually getting the results that, uh, under, getting the result that you need, which is to understand the intervention itself uh, being effective or not. Um, once this has been done, uh, the FDA can give approval for the product to be marketed, but its approval is in conjunction with a variety of variables, particularly the kind of people, the dosages, and the contraindications, and all of those go on the so-called label. Um, once a drug is on the market, uh, these, the companies that are selling it are free to advertise it, but only to market it for those uses, populations, dosages, et cetera, that were part of the approval from the FDA. Now, this doesn't mean that physicians can't use it for something else. This is very typical. Physicians may prescribe so-called off-label, and sometimes it has a very strong scientific basis based on uh, experience over the years that's been reported in medical journals. Uh, but the companies are not allowed to begin marketing it for those things unless they go back, do additional testing to confirm that it is safe and effective for the uses, and then they can get a supplemental label. Uh, next slide, please. Now, under an emergency situation, we don't necessarily have the time to go through those very careful steps. And there is a provision for so-called emergency use authorization. It is important because <clears throat> although um, physicians do have this kind of off-label uh, privilege, it also will allow for unapproved products to now be moved into use or for unapproved uses of an approved product that is an off-label use uh, to, be, uh, to, to be advertised. <clears throat> and it is something that has additional kinds of, uh, of attributes, including, rather importantly, that it offers liability protection to those who provide these kinds of uh, products. Um, you know, it's, <clears throat> it's not medical malpractice to do something off-label, but um, it can suggest to some people that this is less than meeting the usual standard of care. Uh, liability protection is very helpful for the providers and the federal protections will also preclude state actions. Now to get to the emergency use authorization, there is a rather um, complicated procedure having to do with determinations related to a chemical, biological, radiological, or nuclear threat, determinations made by Homeland Security, the Defense Department, or, the H or HHS followed by the HHS secretary now having concluded that the circumstances justify an emergency use authorization. <clears throat> For example, that there are not good products already available to treat whatever this risk is. And only then is FDA allowed to issue the EUA. And it's notable that usually this is done based on some amount of real evidence of safety and efficacy based on preclinical work, in vitro and animal, uh, some anecdotal, um, next slide. We've seen an EUA now uh, issued for two drugs where actually a lot of that preclinical evidence just doesn't really ex exist for this new use. Uh, nonetheless, uh, <clears throat> just about 10 days ago, issued a for uh, hydroxy, um, sorry, <clears throat> hydroxychloroquine sulfate and chloroquine phosphate. Um, there are some extra protections. There are fact sheets that providers must have that will highlight the known risks and drug interactions. But again, um, it's not clear that the risks in this particular context can be well understood. And we do know these particular drugs do have some significant risk factors to them. Also, under the EUA, the drugs can be distributed from the strategic national stockpile. Uh, it's aimed at uh, people who are able to give consent, that's adolescents and adults. You'll notice that Dr. Casadevall mentioned pediatric needs, and that complicates this consent process. Uh, but another important limitation is that it's used under the EUA when a clinical trial is not available or not feasible. The idea is that if you've got clinical trials that will actually tell you if this works, that's where we should be going first. Next slide. Um, Conducting clinical trials, which is crucial for truly understanding what will work and for whom, uh, during a pandemic has some significant challenges. Um, 
One of them is understanding what the risk-benefit ratio might be. Dr. Kasenval pointed out that for the um, plasma transfusions that the risks appeared to be fairly low compared to the potential benefits. Uh, but for any kind of new use or new product, it is by definition going to be more difficult to estimate risks and benefits uh, in advance. The second has to do with which people you're going to treat uh, as, as research subjects. Uh, the people who are sickest uh, may be it, the greatest need for this new emerging option, um, but number one, it may not work as well for them as it does for those people who are at earlier stages of disease. And second, they are typically people who have other uh, problems, other comorbidities, and therefore are going to be complex people for whom it'll be difficult to tease out how much of the response is due to the intervention and how much is being uh, complicated by their underlying conditions. Um, that would suggest then that you use uh, instead a population of people with a milder form of the illness, uh, and that can solve some of those problems, but at the same time, it doesn't give you the information you really want uh, often, which is, can you use this as a rescue therapy for those people who are really in extremis? Uh, and particularly for those people who are in extremis, um, it is complicated to get consent uh, to participate in a research trial. Uh, some of these people are now suffering from some degree of cognitive incompetence because of the effects of the disease. And in this particular situation of an infectious disease, uh, we've seen many, many hospitals and institutions determine that they simply cannot allow uh, visitors to stay with the patient, family members who typically would be available in other hospitalized situations. Uh, this makes it hard to find the appropriate surrogate decision maker to allow somebody to be placed into a clinical trial. Uh, it can also be difficult sometimes to figure out uh, how to reach them remotely. Certainly the communicate, although it's helped by things like the Zoom uh, medium we're using now, is not the same as the kind of personal interactions that ordinarily would take place. Now, consent can be something that we... Um, we get rid of in emergency situations. Typically, these have been in trauma situations, a car accident, and you need to have a test for, let's say, a, a new kind of synthetic blood product. Um, and there's simply no time to be looking for consent from anybody. Um, but we can also see how they could be used in these circumstances. Um, so you could use the special protocol for emergency consent it tends to be limited to life-threatening circumstances. So now again, we're talking about the sickest population, not the kind of mildly ill population. Uh, and it involves at some point, some degree of notification to the community that this is gonna be going on, that some people are going to be put into a clinical trial for this new therapeutic intervention uh, without necessarily knowing in advance and without their surrogate decision makers knowing in advance that they're being recruited and others might be kept on the control arm, uh, which here would mean all the kind of current support mechanisms. Uh, there is obviously a difficulty in community notification uh, when you've got a pandemic that's as broad as this, as opposed to a kind of isolated clinical trial in a single neighborhood or a single uh, region. Next slide. Uh, there are other kinds of challenges that have to be met before one can continue on with the effort to do the clinical trials. Uh, trials are typically approved not only by the FDA, but by a local institutional review body. Um, or, and that <clears throat> process has often been uh, criticized as being overly lengthy. Uh, some IRBs are well set up to have a quick response, others not. Uh, so this can be something that slows things down without careful selection and complete information immediately to the people on the IRBs so that they can evaluate independently risk benefit and recruitment strategies. Um, choosing a site for the trial um, so that you can in fact use emergency consent procedures can be very, very important. And <clears throat> next, probably the biggest problem really is the balance between using these therapeutic interventions off trial. Um, there is a kind of a core dilemma with clinical trials in the United States in which um, people sometimes simultaneously in their own minds, but certainly as between populations, view being a research subject either as being a guinea pig and feeling like they've been exploited or viewing it as an opportunity to get the best and newest thing out there. 
Uh, and in circumstances like this, um, where there really are no good therapies available, the chances are that there's going to be a lot of interest in trying whatever seems to be the newest intervention, regardless of whether the risks are yet well understood. That means that it can be very difficult to get the control arm. That is, how do you get people to agree not to take the intervention and be part of a clinical trial when their perception, even before it's been proven to be effective, is that it might be effective. And we heard already about the historical information that suggests that it might. Um, one way of responding to that has been the expanded access programs. Um, we've seen these before during the HIV uh, crisis beginning in the 1980s, so-called parallel track was created. And the idea was you have clinical trials where people are really going to have to have a control arm so that we can actually see if the therapy is working as compared to standard. But if you're not near a clinical trial site or their clinical trial has already recruited a full cohort of subjects, then you can get access to the new intervention off of this expanded access program. Uh, it's very important to make sure that the expanded access program doesn't swamp the clinical trials to the point that you can no longer do the kind of prospective randomized work that's necessary in order to really determine if this works. We have had some very notable failures of interventions that people grasp at. Uh, the bone marrow transplant for um, uh, breast cancer <clears throat> that had not responded to chemotherapy is a good example, where it simply made people more miserable and sicker rather than helping in any way. Um, once your clinical trial is underway, and especially against this backdrop of some degree of panic and uh, rapidly changing information, it can be very hard to maintain what's called clinical equipoise. That is, a moment in the clinical moments in the clinical trial when you truly don't know which is better, standard or the standard plus intervention. Um, because the moment that you have moved beyond equipoise and you really think the intervention is having a good effect, you have to ask, is it still ethical to recruit people into a control arm? And this is a subtle problem because you may have intimations of effectiveness but not yet the kind of statistical uh, validation that you need to be confident about those results. And often it's important to have an independent group of people, a data monitoring board that can make these kinds of judgments a little bit more dispassionately. Last, um, on this particular slide, I want to mention that it's really important to manage public expectations as soon as there's any advertisement of any kind of intervention. Um, there are already some examples of fraudulent offers out there of so-called cures or prophylaxis, and we're seeing even stem cell, stem cell quote unquote therapies being advertised. Um, so once we begin talking about possible interventions that will treat, it's really hard as a communication strategy to um, make sure that the public understands which things are really under investigation and which things are probably completely fraudulent. Next slide. Um, so as you heard already, Johns Hopkins has gotten the uh, okay now to start testing these blood therapies. And um, next slide. Again, as was mentioned uh, just yesterday, the FDA already began to issue recommendations that will help construct these kinds of things having to do with the pathway, which patients are eligible, and what kind of record keeping is needed. Next slide. I want to conclude though on just a few extra considerations that are aimed not at therapeutic interventions uh, for people who are sick, but for prophylaxis. Um, this is a different kind of problem because here you've got a subject population that is healthy. And so our tolerance for putting them at risk tends to be lower because we are not nearly as confident that there's going to be a benefit for them. Um, and you <clears throat> still need to make sure that if you do have such a clinical trial, that the people in the control group um, have standard precautions and are not abandoning them, and the people that are in the intervention group particularly are not abandoning standard precautions. This is why for HIV clinical trials, for example, it was very important that those who were testing new drugs continue to maintain safe sex practices in order to make sure that they were not putting themselves at added risk. Uh, there's going to be a need to select the population from a high-risk region uh, because you need to quickly have a population of people where you can see a significant difference between those who had the intervention and are now, we hope, not getting sick and those who are continuing to get sick. 
which makes this clinical equipoise problem and uh, when to stop the trial uh, even more problematic and when to move on to try to give prophylaxis to the widest population possible. Uh, in some cases, you might want to ask questions about who should get the prophylaxis first. In some cases, you might want first responders, the medical personnel who are exposed immediately, including uh, and also perhaps uh, police and fire to be given higher priority when it comes to the prophylaxis. But remember, as soon as this is available, there's often going to be a public demand for it. Um, and <clears throat> that demand may easily swamp the availability of the prophylactic intervention, which makes this question of prioritization very important. Uh, I'm going to stop there because I know that you want time for asking questions and thanks very much. Well, thank you. I think that was a very, very useful um, and efficient overview of a lot of important and complex issues about the challenges of doing clinical research in this kind of a crisis that is so marked by both a sense of urgency and a lot of uncertainty. I'm starting to get questions from our viewers. And um, so let me, I was going to ask a question of my own, but I think since we started late, I'll uh, plunge right into the questions um, from from our viewers and and um, Dr. Charo, as long as we're keeping you busy, a follow up question. Um, uh, someone asked if you could discuss more about your concerns with FDA and the okay for the EUA for hydroxychloroquine. It probably won't surprise you that you're getting that question. Um. Sure, and uh, but there's a limit. There's a limit on what I can say because I don't have all of the data that was in front of the FDA. Um, but typically, there is more information from both in vitro studies and from animal experiments, or from a, a wider range of anecdotal reports before the FDA would use that information to justify the emergency use authorization. Uh, in this particular case, it seems like the anecdotal reports were very limited in number. And uh, the in vitro evidence I haven't even seen particularly. Uh, so there was some surprise that the EUA was issued. Um, but considering the publicity that these drugs were already getting and the pressure from some members of the public to obtain them, to self-treat um, even at some expense to their own health, unfortunately, uh, it became rather important, I think, for the FDA to try to step in and have some degree of control over what's going on. Uh, and certainly getting fact sheets out as quickly as possible may be of some small help. Thank you. Just a quick follow-up. Someone else was asking about, is there a, an established mechanism for distribution of products that are approved with EUAs? Is it a specialized route or does it go through the normal um, avenues of, of physician prescribing? You know, I think that Dr. Hamburg, I think that you're probably better positioned to answer that than I am, having been the commissioner at the FDA. Uh, I know it comes from the strategic stockpile, but perhaps you can answer that question. Well, I think it is available through the strategic stockpile, and I think it also can be available through other um, mechanisms of, of care. Uh, so uh, let's, let's move on then. Thank you. Um, other questions that we've gotten uh, for um, Dr. Casa Deval. Um, there was a question about how does the work you're doing with convalescent plasma relate to some of the therapies that are being developed for monoclonal antibodies? And I guess, you know, to elaborate on that question, it, do you see the, the convalescent plasma work as sort of a bridge to other um, drug therapies that would be logistically easier, as you know, in terms of administration and collection, uh, development of the materials? Um, or do you see all of these potentially going forward um, in parallel? Uh, absolutely. I think that, um, I think that today uh, many groups are making monoclonal antibodies already. Uh, and in fact, there is an effort to, to collect convalescent sera to make a hyperimmune IVIG preparation by the pharmaceutical industry that will actually be a pharmaceutical product, no different than the hyperimmune serums that we have today. The way I look at convalescent serum, it is, it is available today. Monoclonal antibodies will take months at least to be available for clinical trials. And the, and the immune 
intravenous gamma globulin is also going to take many months because then it just it just needs a, a development pipeline. So it, between now and then, we think that the blood of those who recover may have antibodies that can help those who are getting sick. Thank you very much. Um, now a question for Dr. Lowe. Um, there was a concern about what do we know about whether the detectable RNA is actually um, uh, likely to correlate with infectivity. Yes, yeah, so, so I, I think that's one of the questions that remains unanswered. And so one of the things that public health officials and uh, clinical leaders are, are having to navigate is what does this evidence of positive RNA in different specimens and different um, aerosol droplet or particle sizes mean in terms of translating that to practice. So I, I think we're all walking that balance of there, there seems to be emerging body of evidence that uh, the virus can be carried on droplets, but we're still lacking that definitive proof, proof of infectious virus in those droplets. And a follow-up practical question, what, what do your findings mean for people who are caring for infected individuals in their homes in terms of strategies for um, uh, decontamination and reducing risk exposure. Absolutely. So again, I'm, I'm going to phone a friend back to NIOSH and that, that figure, that upside down triangle of the hierarchy of controls. Um, so NIOSH did a great review of masks in home isolation and found that they, it doesn't necessarily convey any protection within that household across a number of studies. Um, so I think if we look at the bottom of that, of that pyramid, right, PPE, we're better off implementing, um, you know, distancing, a geographical or spatial distancing, and cleaning. Um, if we can implement those, it connotes more protection than just having someone who's infected wear a mask around people who aren't. If we can physically separate them and we can clean that space regularly, it's going to have a, a, a better um, result. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, back to you, Dr. Uh, Casa Duval, um, with a question about what work is being done on post-infection markers of COVID-19 infection that can be used to identify potential plasma donors that were not tested at the time of active disease. And I guess this also gets us into uh, the whole area of serology tests and, and their utility. So a tremendous amount of work has been done and it's been done by many groups at the same time. And the ideal here is that clearly not every, every unit of plasma is different. And there must be units of plasma that are gonna be great and there are gonna be units of plasma that are marginal. So if you could identify the units of plasma that are great, you're much more likely to have a better outcome. So uh, that requires establishing virus neutralization tests with the coronavirus, as well as developing, uh, learning from the serology, which are the good antibodies, where do they bind, what is the right cocktail. I can only tell you is that this is a very hot area. People are working on it very hard. And hopefully this information may even become available during what I call the convalescent plasma phase of fighting against COVID-19, which is the early place. And it will also inform what follows the, the hyperimmune globulin that will hopefully be available later this summer and the use of monoclonal antibodies, but it's a hot area. Thank you. And maybe I'll just use that to go back to Professor Cheryl for a moment. Um, uh, there's been some discussion that with modifications in the emergency use authorization uh, approach and um, and some of the different products now turning to diagnostics in the serology tests. Um, while the FDA has warned some manufacturers about the need not to make claims that they can't um, actually justify in terms of their product, uh, some of these serology tests are in fact not going through the, the sort of more traditional uh, EUA process. I'm wondering if you have some perspectives on that, if you um, know sort of why that determination might have been made um, uh, or some, some thoughts and how you think uh, that may play out over time. Uh, 
Well, certainly, I think this discussion goes back uh, several weeks, it feels like several years now, uh, to the lack of uh, tests available. Um, and there was a fair amount of publicity suggesting that the fault uh, would lie entirely with the FDA's onerous process for obtaining an emergency use authorization for a diagnostic test. Uh, I think the more time that goes by and the more investigation that goes by, we understand there were many elements that led to the slowdown in obtaining those tests. Um, and there were a few that had to do with the kind of process of submitting information and getting it properly entered at the FDA um, that needed to be changed and were changed. But um, a bigger change that came was one that now does offer a few dilemmas for us. And that is that under the previous system, you first had to submit to the FDA the diagnostic test you wanted to use and data that supported its um, analytical uh, validity and its clinical utility, uh, and the FDA would then respond with a yes or no about whether or not you could go forward. Uh, there, that's now been turned on its head in which people can now develop tests and begin using them without even having gotten any kind of FDA involvement. There is a, a few weeks afterwards where you're supposed to then try to provide the information that would justify its use. Secondly, there had been some controls on the quality of the laboratories that were doing this, so that uh, only those laboratories that had been shown in the past to meet the tests that prove they can do complex work would be eligible for producing the diagnostics. And uh, the new policy has now broadened the range of laboratories for a variety of reasons. When it comes to the serological testing, we're going to be in an interesting kind of situation because uh, it will not necessarily be an existing product for which we're talking about a new use, where at least there's some history of the risk benefit balance as, as prescribed, but an entirely new product um, which needs to be reviewed and approved. And again, this can come up under the EUA, but I think it ups the ante on the uncertainties uh, surrounding it and uh, I think is a little bit more nerve wracking. Uh, when you don't have to have any submission to the FDA prior to beginning its use uh, in, a, in a compassionate or expanded access program, which will expose many, many people to the new product. Thank you. Very useful perspective. I think it might be interesting. We're getting a lot of questions about compassionate use and where that fits in. And actually, you know, we have the opportunity for Dr. Casa Duval, who's working on a clinical trial right now, um, where it's important, as you noted, to do the controlled studies to get the, the, the uh, you know, robust answers about how this works and for whom, but also an uh, intervention that is available through compassionate use. Um, Professor Charo made the observation that, um, you know, there are concerns that as these drugs become available, uh, to providers and patients through other mechanisms that it can potentially compromise uh, the ongoing clinical research. So I thought, you know, maybe, you know, sort of a, a, a real world perspective from you, Dr. Casa Duval, and then maybe also you have some other comments you'd like to make. Uh, I think you're absolutely right. I think that um, first we have a scarce product. Second, we have a lot of people who need it. Uh, and um, as, as people are quite sick, I think that it's going to be very difficult to do trials in the very sick, uh, simply because compassionate use is available. And maybe that's, that's the way it should be. I do think that early on, for uh, when people are just getting symptoms, uh, it may be possible to evaluate how well this prevents uh, pulmonary deterioration. And it should be possible to do the trials uh, in, in prophylaxis because there we're really looking at preventing people from getting ill and hopefully for preserving the, our, in, our infrastructure, people who need to go to work, and as well as people who are getting exposed to this horrible disease. I will tell you that in every single epidemic that I looked at, convalescent zero is used. Doctors in the middle of it use it, and they often write that they feel it works. And then after it happens, people do retrospective trials and they criticize it for not having done a prospective trial. And I, I begin to see how difficult it's gonna to be to do that with a product that is relatively safe and yet can provide and, and has a history or a very encouraging history. 
but we are determined to try. I think we need, we have a responsibility to try to, to do good medicine, to do good science, because we're gonna be at this for a while. And if we can figure out how to fig do this right up front, perhaps we can help a lot of people in the, in the next few months and maybe years. Thank you. Dr. Shero, do you have some additional thoughts on this issue? Um, well, just a very quick clarification. Now, the words compassionate use don't actually appear in the statutory authorities. Um, what it is is really a permission for the use of an unapproved product that ordinarily cannot be placed into interstate commerce. I know that's kind of uh, too technical for this population. Um, and it is really designed for very limited number of cases, which is why when you've got a situation like the one here, you move to a broader program, the so-called expanded access program. And here we may find the compromise that Dr. Casadevall is talking about. If the clinical trials need to be developed using a population of people with a milder uh, form of illness so that you're more confident about um, the results that you're seeing and able to tease out the intervention versus everything else, then you might then find that compassionate use on a broader scale is going to become available to those people who are in extremists and are really um, close to death. That population is the one that may need it the most, but their, their situation is so complicated now that it would be hard to evaluate the effectiveness of this particular um, plasma transfusion if we use them in the trial as well as now enhancing all of the problems of, of ethically um, recruiting them into such a trial. Well, I think another issue that emerges, and maybe I'll quickly turn back to Dr. Casa Duval, and then there are a lot of questions on environmental exposures and aerosol transmission. So Dr. Lowe, we're coming back to you. But um, there, there is some sense that we can learn a lot from the um, use of these products through compassionate use or the, the expanded um, availability that, has, that will come with the emergency use authorization. Getting reports from physicians and patients about the use um, and so-called real world data about you know, disease progression sounds promising on one level, but when you're really talking about getting robust scientific answers, obviously it's very challenging, especially for a disease where most people get better anyway. So I'm just wondering, um, as you're going about your research, Dr. Casa Duval, um, how, how do you think about the role of this other sort of approach of more observational data uh, and, uh, reporting uh, as compared to your controlled clinical trials? Dr. Heimberg, I think you're absolutely right. In fact, when you look at the reports that are coming out from, uh, from China and, the, and you're learning a lot from observational studies, you're learning a lot from what happens to an individual when you infuse them with plasma. You learn that the viremia is reduced. You learn that in some cases they're getting out of respirators. Uh, however, uh, they are not controlled, and we need to be very cognizant of, of these biases. But every time that you use these products, there is learning uh, that occurs. I, you know, I'm encouraged that, that it may be possible to, to, be, to do very good observational studies. If you, have a, if you have a limited product, for example, and the way you're using it, you may be able to compare it to other people who are not receiving it. And I would also... I'll throw something out for you to think about it. Everyone in this, or think about it. Many of the great drugs that we use today never went through this kind of studies. There was no <laughs> randomized controlled trials for penicillin. Uh, does it mean that it doesn't work? No, uh, it means that we have learned how to do and we have learned the risks that come with biases and things like that. And we try to minimize them with randomized controlled trials. But I think at the end of the day, we are, all try to be astute observers and to try to learn from this because we know that this clinical information can be translated and used uh, in the future. Thank you, very informative. Well, I'm told that there are now 600 questions in the queue and we've got 10 minutes left. So I don't think we're gonna to get to them all, I apologize, but a lot of questions were stimulated by your remarks, Dr. Lowe. Um, and let me just see if I can get a few of them out for discussion. Um, questions about sort of what's 
what's your sense of the, the relative prominence of different modes of transmission? Is it still mainly respiratory droplets that we need to be concerned about? Or is aerosol, um, you know, something that, that really also is a dominant mode of transmission? Does that affect how we think about our own, our own behaviors, the wearing of masks, the, the distance for social distancing when going outside, et cetera. So, and, and also maybe if you can just quickly sort of compare your experience with, with this novel coronavirus and its modes of transmission to uh, flu and measles as well. Yeah, so a, a few, there's a lot to unpack there. A few things that I want to highlight related to the conversation that we just had with Dr. Casa Duval and Professor Sharo. I, I think this also, the broader conversation underscores the value and the need to develop multi-site rapid response clinical trials networks ahead of, of emergencies, which is incredibly complex and difficult to do. It's hard to get all of those partners um, on board when there's not an emergency to respond to, to get the, the review frameworks um, and the regulatory frameworks and agreements in place when there's nothing, there's nothing to investigate at the moment. Um, we, we do have one that was established, the Special Pathogens Research Network across the U.S. that has 10 sites that committed to this. Um, and I think it's important to note that this network was one that got uh, the remsidesivir clinical trial up and running within 72 hours of the first patient arriving at one of those sites. And so I think this is something that, that underscores the importance of doing preparedness and planning, especially with respect to both clinical research and the regulatory frameworks for such research so that um, we can implement really broad, rigorous studies. It can be done. It just requires a lot of time and effort not knowing what we might be conducting research for. So I just wanted to underscore that. Um, in terms of the questions that you asked, I, I think that what we're seeing is we, we're really hammering home the droplet and fomite potential related to SARS coronavirus. Um, in terms of the aerosol transmissibility, I think the thing that is, is going to come out in the future and that we're really going to look at is that we've traditionally looked at droplet and aerosol in two discrete categories, um, where you've got kind of the measles-based aerosol transmission, which is highly transmissible, um, that those uh, infectious particles are gonna be carried vast uh, distances on very small particles for a long period of time. And I think what we're going to start seeing, there's a growing body of evidence that this is more a spectrum as opposed to two discrete categories, um, where different diseases like influenza and coronaviruses probably fall somewhere in between a firm droplet transmissibility and the measles-based aerosol transmission and that there's a continuum there based off of particle distributions and concentration of pathogen in those various particle sizes. So I think that moving forward, this is going to be a significant area of, of focus in terms of protecting our healthcare workers. Um, you know, this is anecdotal and I think something that, that we need more evidence on, but I think the evidence that's coming out with um, the RNA being carried on small one to four micron droplets, um, that we're, one, we're gonna look for those infectious virus particles, but I think it's supporting this notion that for sustained regular close contact, right? That that is going to increase the likelihood of an aerosol transmission events of those individuals that have sustained close contact in that space, um, whether it be within six feet or outside the six feet, but that we're getting back to that infectious dose principle in terms of what is it we really don't know. Um, is, is there sufficient um, infectious virus in very small particles to infect someone, or is it repeat exposure to multiple particles of a small size that's going to bear the risk? I think there's a complex studies that are difficult to carry out uh, in the in the operational environment, but I, I think we'll see much more evidence coming forward in the future. Thank you. And there, I know it's not your area of specific focus, but a lot of questions about seasonality. Um, since you've worked a lot with Singapore, where they've obviously had cases and it's hot, um, I don't know if that's enough to give us insights, but um, in your work, um, have you uh, been able to, to develop you know, some uh, evidence that would be useful as we think about whether to expect to see um, seasonal variations with this novel coronavirus? <laughs> 
Yeah, so I, a lot of modeling and projections around that, that topic. And I think uh, the best models and projections that I've seen related to that do tend to indicate with raising temperatures, there's likely to be lower transmission. But then on the flip side, higher uh, levels of humidity tend to counteract that trend. So I, I, I think there's not really good data to definitively say um, that, that necessarily humidity or temperature really impact transmission. It's probably going to be more driven by um, behaviors of people, of humans in different environments. That is in cold environments, we tend to stay indoors in closed confined spaces and have greater human to human contact. Whereas when it's warmer, more people are outside and, and, and at greater distances. Really hard to unpack all of that, but the models seem to say uh, higher temperatures, lower transmission, but that may be counteracted by higher humidity. Well, thank you. And one last question is going to go to you, Dr. Lowe, because I think we're going to have a chance in a later webinar to circle back to some of these drug treatment issues, but we want to take advantage of your expertise right now. Um, a question about um, ozone and UV light for killing the virus. Should we be integrating that into uh, some of our uh, healthcare management settings? Is it something to think about as a, a protective um, measure in, in uh, high density gathering sites going forward if we're going to be living with this virus over time? Um, and uh, how, how do you think is the best method for us to be thinking about sanitizing overall? Um, yeah, so great question. Um, I think cleaning in general is, as we've, as we've shown in our partners in Singapore displayed, is, is incredibly effective for the SARS coronavirus too. Um, we saw widespread use of UV in China to disinfect things like buses and, and really large complex spaces that can take a long time to manually disinfect, so there's promise there. Um, in terms of ozone, ozone can be used more as kind of a, an air uh, cleaning agent um, but uh, its efficacy for whole room decontamination is complex. It introduces a different range of occupational exposure risks for, the, for healthcare workers in that it's a, it's a noxious gas. You have to contain it in that space at a high enough concentration to inactivate viruses, which of course bears risks to providers that are in that space. Um, strong evidence uh, for use of UV light and vaporized hydrogen peroxide for whole room disinfection, especially in hospitals and in different environments, um, generally has lower occupational exposure hazards uh, that comes with it as opposed to a true gas. Um, and both of these are used in quite a few hospitals already as a tertiary or terminal option after you've done manual cleaning to go in and do a much more broad disinfection step. Well, thank you so much. It's clear that we could spend a lot more time discussing these issues and that our uh, speakers have a breadth and depth of knowledge that could enlighten us all. But this does uh, really need to uh, conclude our webinar for today. Our next webinar uh, will take place next Wednesday, April 15th at 5 p.m. Uh, Eastern Standard Time, and it will focus on crisis standards of care. Everyone registered for this webinar will receive an invitation to the next one. I do want to say to all the people whose questions were not uh, asked and answered during this uh, webinar that um, a, a frequently asked question sheet will be being developed in response to those questions to respond to the sort of different broad categories of questions that have arisen. So monitor the website uh, for that. Also, I want to remind you that this webinar has been recorded. The recording, a transcript, and slide presentations will be available on covid19conversations.org. So let me just extend the deepest thanks to our panelists. Great presentations, great discussion. I wish, wish that we could have continued on, but time doesn't allow. Let me also thank uh, APHA and the National Academy of Medicine for sponsoring this webinar series. And thanks to all of you listeners for joining us today, uh, for supporting this new uh, modality for doing these kinds of panels. But I think it worked. I was a little skeptical, but I think that um, 
that we're finding new ways of talking about really important issues and coming together as a, a, a scientific community and the public to be able to ask and answer a set of critical questions for our own health, the health of our communities, and ultimately our nation and the globe. So thank you all. Best wishes for your health and safety. Take care. And we are now adjourned. Thank you so much.